can't imagine that you all are not as touched as I am. Join me in welcoming Barry Jenkins. Love and sisterly affection, Baron. Brotherly love and sisterly affection. Absolutely. I haven't heard that one before. Thank you, oh, my dear. Y'all so, so close, bro. <laughs> like right, like right, right here, right? Here, right? <laughs> Are you cool, bro? You all right? All right, man. It seems intense, man. <laughs> so, Barry, I have great admiration for your love poem, your lyricism for James Baldwin. I'd like to ask you your reaction after you read this book the first time. Yeah, the, the first time I read it, uh, you know, a friend sent it to me, uh, a friend who works in film, and she recommended that I read the book. She said, I think there's a movie um, in this novel and you'll be the perfect person to adapt it. This is way before uh, Moonlight or any of that stuff. And usually when people do that, it goes in one ear and out the other. So when I read it, I was surprised and I was so grabbed uh, by the text. You know, Mr. Baldwin had many voices that he wrote in, but two of the primary voices, one of those was obsessed with sensuality, with romance, with uh, interpersonal relationships, and the other voice was as passionate about systemic injustice and about uh, calling uh, America out on the ways in which uh, its systems disenfranchises the lives and souls of black folks. And I felt in this, in this novel, those two voices were perfectly fused. And uh, I thought it was uh, quite a moving thing to take uh, the story of America in a certain way and frame it through the prism of this couple and their families. You actually wrote this at the same time you did Moonlight. Talk about that experience of doing these two amazing stories simultaneously for you as a creative. What was that process like? Yeah, I mean, I was just, I was like young and You were in the zone, and, huh? No, I wasn't in the zone. I was just broke and, and lonely and stuff. And so, I, uh, a, a friend of mine who's a producer on this film and was also a producer on Moonlight, this woman named Adela Romansky, who I went to film school with uh, at the illustrious Florida State University. Um, she, hey, wait, wait, wait y'all say boo or, or yeah? Hey, 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 hey I'm, I'm a Gator fan actually, so there you go. 4114, bro, 4114. Um, yeah, she, yeah, she got together uh, a little bit of cash and said, what do you need to do to write? I said, I need to be away from, from everything. And so I went to Europe. And uh, I wrote Moonlight in Brussels, and I wrote Beale Street in uh, Berlin. Uh, over the course of six weeks, I wrote the first draft of both screenplays. Um, but I just had no life. I had no cell phone, I had no friends. Um, I was just like lonely, and just focused on uh, the work that was in front of me. So I adapted the book without having the rights to it, which I don't recommend, um, <laughs> because I came back and understood, oh, if I actually want to make this into a film, I have to engage with James Baldwin Estate, and that's what I did. And it was lovely, because instead of going to them and saying, I might do this, I might do that, it will look like this, it might be that, I could show them exactly what I planned to do. And if they told me to just go and walk out the door, and burn the script, that would have been fine. I divorced myself from the results of the process. It was just about the joy of the writing. What did you write? What did you, you sent them your first film. Mm -hmm. Okay, tell me about that letter where you pitched them oh, on adapting. You know, I should, I should go back and, and look it up, man. I'm sure it was very earnest and young. <laughs> and like, I'm just a guy who made a movie with my friends and I love James Baldwin and I want to make this book into a movie. I'm sure it was just like that, but I think the thing of it was, I was very open and honest saying that I love this book, I wrote a screenplay based on it, here it is, I would love to talk to you. Because typically, um, in the industry I work in, you go and you go, I can give you this many dollars, or I have this producer, give me the rights for a dollar, I'll adapt the book and then we'll set it up at a studio. Instead I said, I don't care about the studio, I don't care about the producer, I've already done the work and I want to show you exactly what I plan to do. Um, and so I don't remember what the letter was. I do remember though, because the James Baldwin estate is run by a consortium of his family, uh, run primarily by his sister, Gloria Carifa Smart, who was in her 80s. And so I sent the script out and I sent this, this, uh, this package and everything. I wrote my phone number, my email address. And what came back was something in the mail, typewritten on a typewriter mm -hmm. saying, Hey, young person, you sound very interesting. Please be patient with us. And then four years later, I got the rights to the book. <laughs> the, there's so many things. But, but I made Moonlight during those four years, so uh, all to the good. Okay, okay. Uh, three Golden Globe noms. Congratulations on that. Thank you very much. 
so many things. The, the production, the set design, uh, the casting, let me start there too. I mean, the screenplay, obviously, the casting, uh, and the music. Can we talk about how the music drove the characters uh, and the choice of the music? And even Baldwin references the music in, in his writing. Yeah, the, uh, you know, the, the book has a lot of blues um, in, in, the, uh, in the text. It also has a lot of like really big songs from the era that we could not afford to put in the film, to be brutally honest, and so we went a different way. Um, Mr. James Walden was a jazz man, his father was a jazz man, and as I read the text, it felt like jazz in a certain way. Baldwin has a very interesting way of blending the syntax um, of his sentences, of his, his paragraphs, um, into this way. He just crafts the interior voice in the way that very few people did, and when he's writing about black characters, when we, we don't very typically see the interior voice of black characters depicted in the way that James Baldwin does, it was just super evocative, and so, um, it's interesting. I think the music in this film couldn't exist without the film. Uh, not the other way around. The film could definitely exist without the music. I say that because Nicholas Bertel, our composer, is very diligent about watching what the actors are doing, what the tone, the emotion of the scene is, and then reflecting that um, in the score. And so we started out trying to write a, a purely jazz-based score with a saxophone, a trumpet, flugelhorn, and realized very quickly we also needed strings. Uh, but this really lovely thing happened where Nick was composing uh, writing music to be played by a brass jazz section, but playing it uh, with cellos and in some places violins. And then by the end of the film, it kind of flipped on its head. We were composing for strings and playing it uh, with brass. And um, and we learned some things uh, working on Moonlight. We did like a lot of chopped and screwed, uh, which is like this Houston sound where you like slow things down and repeat certain sounds. And on this film, uh, we applied that in a certain way, but we took it a step further. Uh, there's a song that plays when Tisha Fani first make love. Uh, we call that track Eros, okay. which is really lush uh, musical or orchestral piece of music that involves both uh, strings and, uh, in a very minor way, certain horns. Um, and then later in the film, Brian Tyree Henry, Paperboy, shows up, and uh, he and Fani uh, have this 12-minute conversation. And I don't know what the sound in here was like, but this rumble starts to sort of drift around the room, and Miles Davis's blue and green start to drift around the room. And what you're hearing is the song that played when Tish and Fani first made love, now has been corrupted, you know, by the system, by the trauma that Daniel has brought with him after coming out of the system. And so the sound that, in one sequence, is a symbol of birth and life and joy, has been corrupted by these men's experience, and now it's the sound of death and despair. Uh, to me, in a certain way, um, it's about how, again, uh, you could title this book The Lives and Souls of Black Folks and it would still be the same book because if these characters were allowed to just exist in a vacuum, they would grow to be 87 and have 87 babies um, and live happily ever after, but they have to live in, in America. Mm -hmm. Racist America. Hey, thank you for finishing that sentence. But, okay. yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is what Mr. Baldwin was writing about. We want to take some questions. Uh, we don't have a lot of time, so we're going to take a few questions, if you don't mind introducing yourself. Uh, and yes, I will start with the gentleman who raised his hand. Uh, Sir. Yeah. <clears throat> when I see a lot of period movies, um, a, a lot of them, they, they throw in like an old Motown song and then, you know, some good costumes. But a lot of times they seem like modern people in old clothing. And I didn't feel that with your, your movie. I felt like I was like there, even though you don't like put Nixon speeches and do the things that would specifically evoke the air. Did you like watch old documentary or old movies to sort of get the feel of it? And also your, your lead actress especially, I thought her voice, it just, she didn't sound modern. She sounded like someone from that period. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's, that's a good observation. Um, uh, the question generally was about research and where we looked for visual research on the film and uh, not taking things directly from the era to reference the era. Uh, you know, we wanted a certain timeless quality. Mr. Baldwin wrote this novel f from roughly 1968 to 1973, and so time in it is a little bit fluid, it's a little bit loose. I think in certain ways, um, most of our visual research came from still photography, uh, the work of Gordon Parks, and Roy Decarava. So not necessarily documentaries, um, but certainly in that vein. It's why the, the film is presented in a two-by-one aspect ratio, which is meant to mimic more uh, still photography, still portraiture, and not so much uh, cinema. It's a compromise between the two. Moonlight was 235, this is two-by-one. Um, but yeah, it was one of those things where our production designer, Mark Freeberg, is a born and raised New Yorker, and we told him it was more about the energy of the time, it was more about the vibe of the time, and not so much, as you said, referencing Nixon's speeches, so all these things that would you know, timestamp. It is March 7th, you know, 1973 at 5 in the morning. You know, that wasn't as important to me as the feeling of the era. 
Another question? Um, right over here, this is the way the white hat. Uh, how soon in the writing process are you thinking about um, the color themes that are going to be running through the film? Because I, I remember with Moonlight, everyone, with every, I remember with Moonlight, everyone was really captured with how like black skin looked in blue light. And with this, I see a lot of blue light. I see a lot of this warm light that comes in different periods of time. Like, uh, when do you start thinking about um, color? When do you start thinking about how light is used uh, on these characters? Yeah, the question about the question was about when uh, do I start thinking about color and the way light will be used in the photography and how those choices affect the way the skin is represented in the film. Um, James Laxton, the cinematographer, and I start thinking about this stuff way, way early. Um, but we try to arrive at the answer organically. Uh, so both these films, Moonlight and Beale Street, are in a certain way a reflection of the consciousness of the main character. So they're not going to have the same color schematic. You know, Moonlight is blue because Chiron is feeling that certain way. Uh, in this film, our production designer would have these salons. We would get, sit around his, uh, his apartment uh, once a week leading up in pre-production. It would be myself, cinematographer, production designer, and the costume designer. And we would pass around visual inspiration, color swatches, reference photos. What we realized was the film is kind of like a depiction of purgatory. Mm -hmm. Fani's awaiting trial, so she's trying to bring this child to term. All the while, she's having these memories of all these better times. Again, if their lives is considered in a vacuum, they would be 87 and have 87 babies. Mm -hmm. And so those things are grounded in reality. And the color of those start to take the shape of very golds and greens, these more saturated, warm hues. And so if Regina King's character was the main character in this film, then it would have a different color schematic. So that's how we always approach it. Um, just go with, yeah. Yes. As you worked with the, the source text, they've obviously got a lot more scenes than you can fit into a movie. Were there particular scenes that you knew right away had to, to stay in the script? And were there others that, that it just broke your heart to have to lose? Yeah, the question was about the scenes in the source material <coughs> that I knew right away had to be in the film, and then others that broke my heart to lose. Um, I mean, it takes like 20 hours to read this book, two hours to watch the film, so obviously there's 18 hours of material that's not going to make it. The thing that I wanted uh, in the film that I knew I couldn't have was the story of how Titian Fani met as children. Mm -hmm. I think um, a film is a very malleable format, but for the audience, you've got to keep it within a certain digestible prism. And so to go back, okay, now we're like two weeks ago, and now we're like eight months ago, and now we're going to go 10 years ago. You know, all those time frames, it's kind of hard to orient the audience in a certain way. So we lost that, um, although it's a very lovely scene uh, in the book. Uh, but for the most part, I think uh, the scenes that really grab me the most, you know, this as an adaptation, uh, when you're working in a visual uh, medium, if I can see it, then it's going to be in the film. The scene where Stefan James as Fani is making the sculpture in the last 10 minutes, you know, that's three lines in the book. You know, Fani is working on the wood. It's a very soft wood. He doesn't want to defile the wood. I could see that as him smoking, sunlight beaming into a basement apartment, which is impossible, and the audience circling him. So that was always in. Uh, the one that was tough was the perfume counter sequence, because it's one of my favorite elements in the book, but it doesn't advance the narrative or the plot. And yet, for the condition of this young woman in this time, relatable to the condition of many young black women in this time, it had to be in the film. And so it was about picking and choosing uh, my battles in that, in that regard. But most of it's in. Most of it's in. Yeah. Can we go to the side? Any questions on the side? There's a hand right back there with, with his lovely hat. Oh, with the lovely hat. Yes. <laughs> you know, in my, I see, I was born down in New Orleans, and that looked like St. Charles Street. And, you know, it just brought out a lot of things because my grandmother and them were brought, were brought up on that street when we were kids. And being that your movie had opened that genre, I really appreciate your film. Thank you, man. I mean, the the, uh, the question was about the the movie reminding him of I want to say your Grandma's house on St. Charles Street, maybe. I'm gonna just put it that way. But I think it's cool because we found this quote that opens the film very late in the post production process, and I was always wondering why Mr. Baldwin titled the film "A Bill Street Could Talk." And I think when he says it's up to the reader to discern the meaning of the beating and the drums, and this idea there's a Bill Street in every neighborhood in America, you could title Moonlight if Bill Street could talk, and it would still be the same film. Um, but I do got to say, man, you remind me of uh, that Master P in a loot on, uh, on a seat at the table. When he's like, we got more money than people all say yeah. Charles Street. That's what he's saying, right? <laughs> but I heard you talking, man. You reminded me of it. But, 
<laughs> yes, I well, I appreciate you, Ron. Uh, right, well, right, right here. We have a question. I'm uh, wondering, are you happy that this one got made after Moonlight? Or did you That's a very good question. Movie? The question was, am I happy that this one got made after Moonlight, or would I have preferred it to be the other way around? Interesting. Because the whole point of the trip was to make this film. It wasn't about Moonlight. Moonlight was a happy accident. You know, I didn't even expect to write it. I took Moonlight, the play, with me, thinking I'll write this for like two days, and then once I'm up and writing, I'll stop and switch to Bill Street. That's what I really came here to do. So I always planned to make this first, but I was ignorant. I have the rights to this, so how the hell was I going to make this first? Um, and then making Moonlight, I never expected what happened with it to happen with it. And so, unfortunately for this film, it exists in the shadow of that film, and that shadow is quite, quite large. Uh, because of what happened at the end of the damn Oscars. Um, uh, what are you talking about, all right? But, uh, but I think all things happen for a reason. Uh, there were certain aesthetic things that we tried uh, in Moonlight that we tried out of fear. You know, can I have people look at the camera? Can I have three different actors play this part? Can I this, can I that? And I think, um, not even with what happened with Moonlight out in the public with the awards and all those things, but watching the film itself, you know, it's my first film in eight years. I made it with all these kids I went to film school with. Um, all those things worked. All those intuitive things we did worked. And so making this film, I wasn't working from fear. I was like, yes, at certain points the actor's going to look directly into the camera. And I'm going to cast this woman, Kiki Lane, nobody's heard of, to be the lead in my film. So I think in a way, it all... It, yeah, yeah, that's what I learned. But uh, it's interesting. It's a very interesting thought exercise to see if they were reversed, you know, how the films would be received. We will never know. <laughs> okay, we have... Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, I'm curious about uh, the process of the camera lingering on the faces. And, you know, it wasn't the same amount of time for each character in the various scenes, but, you know, the story is through the faces, and I'm curious about your process with that. Yeah, the question was about the direct-to-camera uh, shots in the film, um, which one of those things that we started doing on Moonlight, that I was like, we're definitely going to do them on this film. Uh, you know, I think that, um, you know, when you read a book, it's a very active experience, you know. Uh, literature is so interior. You read a book, somebody says something, you hear it in your head. The author describes a smell, you smell it in your head. The author goes on a three-page rant of what the character's feeling, and you feel those things. Everything's activated. In a movie theater, it's very passive. You might take a sip. Your phone goes off, somebody goes to the bathroom, you're easily distracted. And so I'm always trying to find a way to make the movie theater be like the inside of your head. So the screen is here, the speakers are all around, you guys are surrounded. Now you're inside the movie's head. And occasionally, you watch a movie, you're never looking directly at the actors. I feel like there should be moments when I take passive empathy and make it active by having you look directly into the eyes of the main characters. I don't tell the actors when we're gonna film uh, these shots. I don't know when we're gonna do them. Uh, but at certain points, the actor and the character kind of fuse. The space between them disappears. That's why those moments very rarely have dialogue. And we always shoot them at a high frame rate in slow motion because I want you to live in those emotions. And this writer for the New York Times pointed out something to me that I had not realized when we started doing these shots. Uh, this woman, Angela Flournoy, did a profile of me in the film in New York Times. She said, when those moments happen on screen, if you are not a person of color, if you are a, a white person, it might be the first time you've ever looked someone of color in the eyes directly for a sustained period in this moment of kind of emotion, and you forced to empathize with what they're feeling. But if you're a person of color, if you're a black person, and you're looking at that person, now you may be seeing your cousin, your aunt, your grandma, someone you know, there's a familiarity, and it takes passive empathy and makes it active. So um, that's why we do them. You know, listen to all this chopped and screw music. I didn't realize it, but I think the aesthetics of DJ Screw is about slowing things down. So the emotions in hip hop, which come at you at such a high BPM, when you slow it down, you can feel all those things, even the vocal quality of the mm. performance. I think visually, when the, somebody's looking direct you, directly at you in slow motion, the same thing is happening. They're blinking slower so that eye contact is sustained. So that's why we do them. Ladies and gentlemen, Barry Jenkins. Thank you. Thank you so much. Please.